conditions. Welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we have an important guest. Will be with us, Ray McGovern. He was a uh, political analyst, a CIA political analyst, and he briefed uh, President Reagan and President Bush, as a matter of fact, but it's Bush the father not Bush, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course we will be speaking with Ray very shortly. We're going to find out exactly what is going on with this war. He had written many articles about this, and he wrote his latest article was Attacking Iran for Israel. Not too many people, ladies and gentlemen, in this truth movement that we consider ourselves part of, actually like to talk about Israel and its responsibility in this war that we find ourselves trapped in. And uh, his uh, article was, the title of his article was, Attacking Iran for Israel. As a matter of fact, Ray is one of the few in this movement who dares to actually mention the word Israel. Many of them try to shy away from and those who I call in the half-truth movement. And if you are going to be in the truth movement, you need to be 100% for the truth. You can't stay away from things. You can't be scared. You have to be brave. And you have to name things with whatever they are. If Israel is to blame, if Israel is to be responsible, if the Israel lobby is to be discussed, it's okay to say Israel. I understand people are afraid of the word anti-Semitism because it is actually a super weapon that kills and it kills a lot faster than a nuclear weapon. Speaking of nuclear weapons, ladies and gentlemen, we had Sarkozy, the president of France. He was visiting the White House a few days ago and President Bush he named him a partner in peace. I would say he is a partner in war because our president is far from being described of being for peace. He is a president of war. He is a president of, if you want to know what fascism is, fascism is in the White House. That's the truth and that's what the truth is. This is a president who has walked all over the Constitution. We do not have a democracy anymore or even a representative republic. Because the guy that we voted, I did not, you did probably, in the White House, he is a man of war. 
He is a man who does not believe in democracy at all. And he is a man who's taken this country down the drain. And you will be going down the drain with him unless you stand up. I'm not really sure if you still have time to stand up, but it's getting close if it's not way past due. Now, Sarkozy, of course, is someone who has been accused of being a scion. A scion is someone who is of a Jewish descent who will work with a Mossad agent in whatever country that he is. And there were some reports accusing, of course, Sarkozy of being a scion or a Mossad agent, but we're not going to go there. All we can say is he is extremely pro-Israel, he is extremely pro-war, and he will never be a partner in peace. Mukasey, similar to Sarkozy, but Mukasey is our next Attorney General who refused to say that waterboarding is a torture. And as a matter of fact, we have some pictures, if we can get to them, on waterboarding to show what waterboarding is all about. And Mukasey, our next Attorney General, he refused to say that it is torture, even though Michael Ledeen, one of the congressional investigators there, what you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is waterboarding. It is where they simulate, they put, they lay uh, the victim, they call him terrorist, they lay the victim down and they put a cloth on his face. I think we have a uh, pictorial drawing exactly right there and they simulate that they, they put water they pour water on this piece of cloth that they have on his face and to simulate drowning now Michael Levine he did it he's a he's our uh, congressman and he's investigating actually he was asking Mukasey if waterboarding if he would consider it torture now Levine he went into an army base and actually experienced what waterboarding was and he came out and said it is torture now remember when he went into that army base he knew that he was not going to be harmed he knew he was not going to die he knew that in case if they see signs of him slipping away they will stop the procedure just imagine what is happening to those people that they consider terrorists. So our next Attorney General is someone who probably considers waterboarding just another form of interrogating and he's okay with that. Of course Alberto Gonzalez was okay with torture. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you one thing. If you want peace, you have to look for justice. If you want peace, you have to look for justice because that's the only way you are going to get peace is if you have justice in your heart. Remember that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without any further ado, let me introduce my guest uh, for tonight is Ray McGovern. Ray is a former CIA analyst. Uh, Mr. McGovern was an intelligence briefer for President Reagan from 1981 to 1985, and he was in charge of preparing daily security briefs for President, the Vice President, the Joint Chief of Staff, the Cabinet, and National Security Advisor. Later, Mr. McGovern was one of several senior CIA analysts who prepared the President's daily briefs for President George H. W. Bush. Upon retirement, always, you know, people when they retire, they get their fish, fishing pole and find them a uh, river somewhere and they go and spend the time fishing. Well, not Ray McGovern. Ray McGovern decided to even work harder for justice. Mr. McGovern was awarded the Intelligence Commendation Medal from Bush. I uh, understand he returned it. And worked for Washington-based nonprofits for uh, before becoming 
co-director of the uh, Servant Leadership School in Washington. Mr. McGovern has become an outspoken critic of the current Bush administration and together with former CIA employees founded the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. I don't know if we can find sanity in this world, but Mr. McGovern and his friends are trying to find it. The organization is dedicated to exposing what these former intelligence professionals, professionals believe to be the mishandling of important intelligence. Mr. McGovern, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Ray, let's let's start with you know where's your fishing pole? You're retired. You're supposed to be um, somewhere in Hawaii fishing or whatever retirees do. Well, uh, the uh, the director of the complex of nonprofits where I work now in the inner city uh, has this to say about retirement. He says retirement is a secular concept. Uh, I'll refer back to your remarks that I overheard just before I came on, and, and that is, if you want peace, look for justice. I think that's so basic that I would like to underscore that and, and to say that uh, in the Judeo-Christian, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, Muslim uh, tradition, I believe, uh, the biblical, in the biblical sense, uh, peace is really just the experience of justice. And if people knew that, uh, then they would, uh, they would have a sensible approach to the so-called war on terror. Instead of shooting up all the terrorists, they would try to figure out what injustices these, these terrorists are, are trying to avenge or trying to right. And things would be much more sensible, and we would have a, a, a very good injection of what you referred to just now as sanity. And you're quite right. There isn't a lot of sanity at work here in Washington. Okay. Uh, uh, Ray, you, in your latest article, which of course your articles are all over the, uh, the internet, anyone uh, need to, uh, uh, would like to see uh, some of Ray's articles, all you have to do is just Google Ray's name and you will see all his uh, postings there on the internet on many, many sites. Now, one of the latest articles you have is attacking Iran for Israel. And uh, let me uh, add one thing. Most of the people in this so-called truth movement that I consider myself part of, most of them will not even say the word Israel. And you are getting braver and braver. Is it braver or insanity that you are coming closer to accusing Israel that we are we, we, that we went to war, actually that we want to attack Iran for Israel, but yet in your article you actually proved the point that attacking Iraq was a major point for Israel. Explain that. Well, you know, I come out of a, a, a very unusual tradition in Washington. I worked for a place, namely the analytic division of the CIA, which for most of my 27 years was able to do uh, what we were set up to do, and that is to speak truth without worrying about uh, appearing uh, un unfriendly or uh, distasteful. In other words, we could speak truth to power, as the Bible puts it. We could uh, speak out without fear or favor. And so when I would go down and brief Congress, it would never occur to me to uh, to trim my remarks uh, to make them more, pal more palatable to this or that uh, uh, body of uh, thought. So it was quite a re revelation to me when uh, I was testifying before the uh, Conyers Committee back in June of, uh, I guess that was 2005. And after uh, the congressmen were very frustrated because uh, we had already dismissed the notion that uh, the reason for attacking Iraq had to do with weapons of mass destruction, of which there were none, or ties between Iraq and al-Qaeda, of which there were none. And finally, one congressman, in some frustration, said, well, will somebody tell me, will somebody tell me why we did it then? And I looked at my uh, co-panelists, and no one seemed to be very interested in replying. So I did, and I said what I've been saying in universities and everywhere else they asked me to speak over the last two years is this. I use the acronym OIL, O for oil, I for Israel, and L for logistics. Logistics being the permanent military bases that the United States wants to set up and is indeed now setting up in Iraq. Now. 
I saw a lot of eyebrows go up, and then I realized, well, wait a second, I'm in a very political setting here, and uh, I just said uh, a word that's uh, con conceived to be impolite in polite circles here in Washington. And so I spelled it out. I said, yeah, I, I say Israel uh, because the people who formulated our policy, namely the ones who justify the invasion and occupation of Iraq, uh, have great difficulty distinguishing between what they believe to be the strategic needs of Israel on the one hand and the strategic needs of the United States of America on the other. And then people get seem to get <laughs> even more upset. And uh, I went on in that vein. I said, you know, the president keeps talking about Israel as an ally, and uh, you should know that there is no defense treaty with Israel. And so, theoretically speaking, that's not quite right to say that we are bound to strengthen the defense of our ally Israel when there is no defense treaty. And what bothers me most, I added, was that uh, General Brent Scowcroft, uh, about as experienced a uh, functionary in Washington as you're going to find. He was the national security advisor for the first President Bush, and uh, he was this President Bush's uh, chair of the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. And what he said uh, just two years before was that Ariel Sharon has our president, George W. Bush, wrapped around his little finger. He has our president mesmerized. Scowcroft's word. And I said, you know, Scowcroft is extremely careful with what he says to the press. So for him to tell the Financial Times that this was the case, not only lost his job, but one has to ask why he did it. And I think why he did it is very simple. He wanted the rest of us Americans to know that we're in a very parlous situation here because our president has a, well, what George Washington would call a... Uh, uh, attachment that uh, a passionate attachment is the words that Washington used uh, to the needs of Israel and uh, sometimes they seem to come first and this just spells a lot of trouble because we get back to the subject of Iran Iran is no threat to us it can't be a threat to us for at least another decade or so it's no threat to Israel either but Israel has that uh, nuclear monopoly and they're darned if they will sit, sit, sit by idly, as the Chinese used to say, and watch Iran have one nuclear weapon. Not to say that there's any proof that Iran is working on one, but let's say they are. Now, the Israelis only have about two or three hundred, and so the notion that this would be a great threat to Israel, well, it, it stretches the imagination. What it does, of course, it breaks the monopoly, and that's a big deal for the Israelis. And one can understand their perspective on that because they don't have much going for them other than this uh, <laughs> two to three hundred nuclear weapons already in place. What needs to happen, I think, is a, uh, a regional agreement to have a nuclear-free Middle East, and that has been suggested. And of course, the Israelis having a monopoly are not interested, but we should make sure that they get interested. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I interviewed uh, Mordechai Benunu about uh, two years, three years ago, and he said at his time he estimated that the Israelis had 200, and uh, I had Joe Sirisioni on the show, I guess about four or five months ago, and he said from the, uh, the data that they have, Israel could not have the 200, but they could have about 150. And I'm thinking, well, if they have 150, I mean, that's plenty enough to destroy that whole region there. And, uh, you know, with Iran, we're, we're thinking that it will have maybe in, in about five years. And by the way, what's up with this five years? I mean, 20 years ago, they were saying five years. So what's, what's going on with this five years? Is that just something that they pull out? Oh, this is very embarrassing. Uh, the intelligence community since 1995 has been issuing estimates maybe every two or three years and they started saying in 1995 mind you so that's what a dozen years ago that Iran could possibly have a nuclear weapon in say five years uh, 1997 um, maybe five years uh, 2000 yeah we think they could have one in five years well it, it got a little embarrassing <laughs> so the last nuclear uh, the last uh, estimate on how soon Iran could get a nuclear weapon was three years ago, and they said that uh, Iran could possibly get a nuclear weapon uh, early to mid-next century. So they're fudging it a little. Most people think maybe 2015. You know, 
Ray. That's based on very flimsy uh, evidence. Yeah, even if Iran has the bomb right now, what would they do with that bomb? Throw it at Israel that has 150 bombs? Or at the United States that has about 15,000 of those things? So it's unrealistic. But let me ask you this. Let's go back to uh, your job as a briefer uh, for the uh, president. Uh, what was the... Uh, what was your job and where are you getting your information from and were you like watching ABC in the morning or reading the uh, New York Times or the Washington Times and going and telling the president what's going on or where did you get your information from? Uh, the reason I'm putting the question this way because I have a follow up on that. Where did you get your information to brief the president? Well, that's a really good question, Hashem, and, and the answer is this. Uh, in this regard, we were also able to function in the way that the National Security Act of 1947, which set up the CIA, uh, meant us to act. Uh, it was not only to be a place which could tell it, tell it like it is without fear or favor, but it was also a place, a central place, where all the information on a given country or subject or issue would come into one box, okay? Uh, in boxes, uh, young people are, are surprised to know, were made out of wood in those days. And six times a day, I would have my inbox. Uh, my responsibilities initially were to watch Soviet foreign policy toward China, the Far East, and Southeast Asia. Anything related to that, whether it was public uh, media stuff, whether it was uh, reports from our, our spies, whether it was intercepted communications. Did you have spies in Iraq? Uh, well, I didn't cover Iraq. Uh, and. Uh, we're talking a long time ago here. We're talking from uh, uh, the 60s through the 80s. But uh, we never distinguished ourselves, particularly uh, being able to penetrate those societies. And I understand that, uh, that there were very few. Uh, there, were, there were no good Okay. The, the, reason, the reason I'm asking this question, Ray, because, you know, I'm sure we had people on the ground. I mean, we spend in millions or probably a billion dollar now on the CIA, so I'm sure we had people on the ground to give us solid information, and uh, which the, that Iraq did not have any weapons of mass destruction. Now, um, th th that's why I was asking, because you did have solid information, so I'm sure the briefers who briefed uh, President Bush before the war about the weapons of mass destruction actually told him that, that they did not have. Now, there is a picture of you on the internet pointing at Colin Powell and uh, George Tenet sitting behind him. Now, later on, George Tenet wrote this kiss and tell book of saying that he really did not uh, agree or approve with that, uh, of what, uh, what, what, took, uh, what happened, but actually he sat behind Colin Powell when Colin Powell said that our solid intelligence tells us that they have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, do, do you think that George Tenet had the right information at that time, or he, he really believed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? He knew they did not. The president knew they did not. The vice president, of course, knew they did not. It was a bald-faced lie. And now it's demonstrably provable. Not only do we have the uh, Downing Street memo, where uh, Tenet told his British counterpart that the intelligence was being, quote, fixed, end quote, around the policy, but we have, uh, you, well, this is very interesting. I'll bet mo most of your listeners or viewers do not know this. Uh, the CIA was justifi justifiably criticized for not having any good spies in Iraq. We didn't have any, okay? Now, uh, there, that didn't prevent my former colleagues from trying their best to get one, and they got one that was worth all the other spies that they didn't get. And you know who that was? Who is it? Well, unless you watch 60 Minutes on one particular Sunday evening about a year and a half ago, you wouldn't know because for some reason our mainstream media didn't pick up on this. But the story is this. My colleagues, using every tradecraft tool that, that is known to man, plus lots of money, and calling in lots of chits from liaison services, recruited the Iraqi foreign minister working for Saddam Hussein. His name is Naji Sabri. Naji Sabri, yes. Yeah. 
So we turned him, okay? That's the technical term we use. We turned him. He's no longer working for Saddam Hussein. He's working for us. What did he tell us? Well, he told us all manner of things that all proved out to be true. What else did he tell us? He told us there were no weapons of mass destruction. Now, my colleagues were justifiably proud at having this, this unique source, and so they called the White House right away and said, you know, we have a new source, a human source, very highly placed, excellent access, we'd like to come down and brief you. And I think the president would like to sit in on this. And so they were, they were invited down the next afternoon. Uh, I guess my friends can be forgiven for spending the first five minutes uh, bragging about how they were able to turn Naji Sabri. But then they said uh, the things that he had told us, and they finished by saying, and Mr. President, he also said that there are no weapons of mass destruction. Now, maybe my friends were naive, but they fully expected this kind of reaction. Uh, what did you say? Uh, what, tell us more about this. What, who is this man again? You know, Or, uh, or maybe a, a, a sigh of relief. Instead of that, they got stony silence, stony silence. And after about a half minute of this embarrassing silence, uh, they were told, well, that would be quite enough today. Uh, thank you very much. And they checked the next day, that is, their deputy director checked, called the White House and said, we have still more information from Naji Sabri. Uh, would you like it, us to send it down electronically, or would you like us to bring it down again today? And the answer was, well, actually, we're not interested in any more information from that source. It's not about weapons of mass destruction. It's about regime change. Okay. Now, I know that. I know these folks who are involved in that. Now, So this is the middle of 2002, six or seven months before the invasion. The president was told by this reliable source. You add that to uh, what Tenet told uh, Sir Richard Dearlove, the British guy, You've got all kinds of documentary evidence. What what the president told Anzar of, of Spain, uh, you know, at, in the late the later stage, Anzar was given the distinct impression that the president's mind was made up, whether or not the UN said yay or nay. So, uh, what we know now, and what the whole all of Americans should know, is that when George Tenet says we really thought there were weapons of mass destruction there, he's lying through his teeth. When the president says, you know, I was deceived by by uh, by the intelligence, he's lying through his teeth. And when the president says other ridiculous things, like uh, Saddam Hussein uh, uh, made our inspectors uh, lead to threw our inspectors out of Iran, uh, out of Iraq, that's a bald-faced lie too, because the inspectors were having incredible success. Never before had there been such an intrusive inspection regime as that which was launched by the UN in late 2002. They inspected his bedroom. Adam's yeah, they were his bedroom. They were, they were everywhere. And what did they find? Zilch. Nothing. And were they thrown out? No, they were not. What happened was, George Bush told Kofi Annan, we are about to do a little shock and awe over Baghdad. Tune into your TV on Thursday night. And by the way, get those inspectors out of there. They're going to get hurt. So it was George Bush that pushed those inspectors out, not Saddam Hussein or Kofi Annan. Okay. Uh, Ray, uh, we're going to go to the phones, and then we'll come back and catch you. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, but let's go to the phones and get some callers, and they've been holding. Uh, Freedom, go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Talawi? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Ray McGovern uh, uh, a question and, and, and see if his, uh, his foresightedness could kind of tell me something about, about what's going on here. Uh, Mr. McGovern, uh, you've been on C-SPAN on a couple of occasions, and, and I've enjoyed it very, very much. But it, it seems that the right-wing talk show hosts have kept you off their shows. Everybody from Rush Limbaugh to Sean Hannity to Bill O'Reilly to, to, to Humphreys to all these guys. You know what I mean? And uh, I want to ask you a question. Is these right-wing talk show hosts a... Uh, uh, a uh, a subsidiary of the CIA because they all use the same talking points, or are they really run by people like uh, the American Enterprise in in Institute? Because for for one talk show host to have the same topic as the other uh, three or four that I hear on, on on our local radio station, could you tell me if the CIA had anything with getting that those talking points ready for these talk show hosts? Because they all seem to avoid any discussion of 9-11. Is a fraud being perpetrated 
on the American people. And thanks very much. Thanks. Ray? Well, um, that's a very good question. Um, Robert uh, Greenwald, uh, the Hollywood producer, has a very, very good documentary called Outfoxed. And uh, you'll find a lot of your answers right in that documentary. Suffice it to say that uh, it's not the CIA that does this. Their activities are oriented uh, overseas. It's the uh, White House itself uh, that runs this uh, propaganda operation where Fox News and all the others get their talking points early in the morning. It's, it's really quite... It's very much like uh, when I used to read Pravda and Isvistia in the Soviet, the Soviet Union, uh, you'd see the talking points in all the, the letter in all the, uh, the major periodicals. And so, yeah, they get their marching orders, and uh, then they, they follow them. And it's, uh, I tell people that I've been around Washington now for 45 years, and the biggest sea change that I have witnessed is the fact that we no longer have, in any real sense, a free media. And that is big. That is very, very big. Okay. Um, uh, Ray, uh, Philip Zilkow, he was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. Now, going back through his history, uh, he's a man who should not even be close to that investigation because he is in line, actually, with, with, with these neocons who basically planned this whole charade. Uh, why... Why can't we get an independent investigation of 9-11? Why is that? We are in a democracy. We're supposed to have the truth. Why we can't get the truth out to the people? Well, the answer there is that, that we have the results of one investigation, and that investigation is a cover-up. Uh, that is the official uh, investigation. Is that why they put Philip Zelkow on top of it? I'm sorry, sir? Is that why they put Philip uh, uh, Zilikow on, on top of it? Sure, yeah. He could be depended upon uh, uh, to do the, the right things, to pursue the right avenues of inquiry and close off others. The, um, the testimony available that we know of that, that was available to that commission and that did not find its way into that report is really, really quite striking. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the... Uh, of the reporting uh, by uh, Secret Secretary of Transportation, uh, Norm Mineta. He was down in the bunker with uh, Dick Cheney. And there's a famous story about that young fellow coming in and saying, uh, Mr. Vice President, just 50 miles out. And later, uh, Mr. Vice President, just uh, 30 miles out. And Mr. Vice President, just 10 miles out. Same orders? Same orders? Yes, same orders. Ten minutes later, oh, something hits the Pentagon. Now, I had a chance to ask Secretary Mineta one-on-one. -on -one. How do you figure that? I saw your testimony before Hamilton. You said that that was 10 minutes before the plane or whatever it was hit the Pentagon. How do you figure that? He said, well, you know, I don't know. I said, well, who was that young young fellow that came? Did he have a uniform on? Well, no, he didn't have a uniform. Well, do you know who he was? No. Well, did you have a check? No. You know, the plane in, in Pennsylvania, you know, it was as though there was a little shade inside his eyelid session which said, Say only Pennsylvania. Say only Pennsylvania. And for the next eight minutes of our conversation, no matter how much I tried, how, how valiantly I tried to get him to focus back on how do you explain what Cheney said to that young man, he could only talk about Pennsylvania. So, you know, it's really, really sad. The next day, by the way, I, I was traveling to, to California, uh, and I, uh, I landed at San Jose um, Airport, and I saw that the name of the airport had recently been changed to Norman Meta International Airport. So I guess if you keep your mouth shut long enough... You get airports I, named I, after I, you. Yeah, right. Yeah, something <laughs> we can all aspire to, Hesham. <laughs> now, Ray, tell me about your encounter uh, recently with uh, Rumsfeld. <laughs> yeah, uh, well... I happened to be going down to Atlanta to receive a, an award from the ACLU down there, and uh, uh, the, the people who were hosting me had called me up about a week before and said, hey, we just found out Don Rumsfeld's going to be down there giving a speech uh, on the afternoon when you're giving one in the evening. I said, oh, get me a ticket. Well, they couldn't find a ticket. And they went to the uh, website of this very distinguished uh, upper crust, predominantly male defense-related think, think tank, and you know what? It was a beautiful website, but there wasn't one word about Don Rumsfeld coming. 
So you know what I did? I went to my friends from The World Can't Wait. And uh, there were some very enterprising young women there that found out how to get me a ticket. And uh, I got one. The worst part of the whole thing, Hashem, was it cost me $40 to hear that I'm not supposed <laughs> to speak. I sat in the front because uh, I saw some old microphones there, and I thought I might be able to ask him some questions. Um, I sat there sort of squirming when he finished because I, I knew I, I had to ask him the questions, but I, I had not the courage that someone like uh, Ann Wright or, or Cindy Sheehan might have. And as I mulled over that, I said, well, what kind of a wuss are you, Ray? Uh, these women wouldn't hesitate a minute. So I got right up to the, to the microphone and, as you probably know, I asked him a couple questions that uh, he, he lied about. And fortunately for me, it was a demonstrable lie because the, the networks had his had his earlier comments on tape, and it was a slow news night. So uh, that uh, that vignette or that that mini debate, uh, impromptu debate, I guess I'd call it, which lasted four minutes, uh, was all over the news, and uh, Rumsfeld was shown to be uh, what we in the Bronx would call a dirty stinking liar. <laughs> Um, now, you know, he was uh, almost, uh, well, I don't want to say arrested in France, because France will not arrest him, but they were, he was uh, supposed to deliver a speech, I think it was last week or the week before, and uh, there were a couple of organizations working on uh, getting, a, a, getting a warrant from a judge to arrest him for war crimes, and uh, as a matter of fact, the Secret Service kind of snatched him away from delivering that speech and drove him uh, he couldn't even leave through the airport, so they, dr they drove him, um, I guess, into, uh, I don't know, Belgium or Germany or whatever the next uh, uh, state over from France. Now, uh, Ray, the, um, you recently had a visit to the West Bank and uh, through uh, some peace group, uh, peace and justice group, or some church group. Uh, tell me about that experience. What did you see in, uh, in Palestine, in the West Bank? Well, I, I, I saw what I had been reading about and studying about and trying to understand. But there's no understanding these things without being there with your feet on the ground, Hesham. It, uh, it was most moving. Uh, but just the sight of that that wall. You know, I've seen walls, and I I served in in Berlin and in the rest of Germany, and I know what a, a wall looks like. And this this wall, which some people call a fence, is several times the size of the Berlin Wall in most of its places. And then I, I had a chance to uh, visit uh, West Bank villages. Uh, we even got up uh, on the Golan, and uh, just to see. Uh, the, you know, the misery uh, that has been inflicted upon these good people, just to, to see the 300-year-old olive trees that have been maliciously uh, chopped down to make way, way for these settlements, and just to see the settlements gleaming on virtually every hilltop uh, near Bethlehem is very distressing. Uh, and uh, we were able to meet with a lot of justice-oriented people, both in Israel and in the West Bank, and uh, that was the good news. People are really trying to repair that situation. But uh, as we, as I looked at it, I said, "Wow, this is a this is a Holocaust as well. It's just a real slow burn, and there may not be six million. Uh, there may be quote well, if you count the uh, uh, diaspora, you, you come up with six million more Palestinians who are who are suffering for no fault of their own." just by a, a terrible miscarriage of justice in history. And, and the sooner we can get a president like Jimmy Carter back in and use the influence that we alone have to promote some justice there, it will never happen. Now, uh, what about, like, you know, you mentioned the wall. What about, uh, like, uh, the settlers there or uh, confiscating land and destroying trees and, and the checkpoints that you had to go through uh, to tell me about that experience. Well, we had less trouble with the checkpoints since we had a Palestinian uh, uh, guide who was accredited to Israel. Uh, we spent one a day and a night on top of the only hill near Bethlehem that has not been seized by the settlers. Uh, this was a hill uh, owned by a family that could, could show documents 
traced back to the Ottoman Empire, showing that they were the owners of that land. But the problem there was that there was no water. We said, how come you have no water? Well, the water was shut off. Well, how do you get water? Well, we have these cisterns, and we collect rainwater, but often uh, that's not enough. We have to go down and, and buy water from the nearest village. And uh, could you help us, please, uh, weed around the olive trees and, and the grapevines tomorrow morning? Well, we did that for four hours. And, and then I said to myself, wait a second, this isn't very biblical. You're supposed to let the uh, good fruit uh, uh, grow up with the, with the weeds, and then the final thing, you, you burn the, the weeds. And then, then I thought to myself, wow. I went to the, uh, to the owner and I said, why do you weed so much? He said, look, he said, if you don't weed, then the weeds are going to drink the water. And we don't have water like that to, to spare, so we need to just have the vines, just have the, the olive trees. And I thought to myself, wow. I said, as bad as the Roman occupation was, they didn't cut off the water. You know, They didn't get a, cut off the water. There were a lot of sort of wow uh, uh, incidents like that, but... Uh, it was just really very, very despicable to see. To see. Well, we had a session on on top of one of these uh, mountains in a settlement, and and a Jewish settler from uh, actually from St. Louis, Missouri, was uh, telling us about how uh, they were only doing what God told them to do uh, in the Bible. And I said, Well, wh where do you find that? And he said, Well, Deuteronomy 15:4. And I said, well, Deuteronomy 15. As I remember that, that says there shall be no poor among you. That's the antithesis of what you're doing. He says, no, 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 no. You have to read the whole thing. It says, Yahweh has promised this land to you. That's what it says. And I looked it up after we were finished, and it does say that, but that's the subordinate clause, Hashem. It says, since Yahweh has given you this land, there shall be no poor among you. Now, when I was learning grammar, um, I was told that the main clause carries the main meaning, and it just points at the whole problem and goes back to what you were saying before, justice, okay? The reason, the reason that the Israelis have the land is so that they can promote justice, and in the past, uh, you look at the Bible, when they erred from that, when they started getting big, fat, and, and, and wealthy, uh, that's when... Uh, bad things happen to the uh, to the Jewish people. So here I was being treated treated to a little uh, lecture on how uh, the whole thing is about land. It's not about justice. God promises the land, and that's it. And I'm saying, well, gee, you know, it's uh, that's the subordinate clause. The main clause says, "There shall be no poor among you." Look down from this mountain and see what you all have done to the Palestinian people who are native to this land. Okay. Um, uh, Ray, let's go back to um, uh, uh, Iraq for a little bit. Now, back in the 1980s, actually back in 1982, there was a document that was published. Uh, it was a Mossad document. The title of it was Strategy for Israel in the 1980s. And in that document, they specifically said that they had taken every Arab country and, and said this is how we're going to uh, weaken the uh, uh, the enemy, and they took Iraq and said that we have to remove the uh, this regime and divide the country into three or uh, or more states. And then after that, uh, uh, the uh, defense planning guidance was written by Richard Pearl and uh, Wolfowitz. And uh, 1996, they uh, also the same people who actually were involved in the defense planning guide, uh, guide uh, or guidance. Uh, also, uh, a lot of them wrote the uh, clean break, which was written for um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time. And in it, it did say that removal of Saddam Hussein from power is an Israeli objective in its own right. And then the same people brought us the project for the new American century. And so the planning for what is happening to Iraq and what's happening to actually a lot of the Arab countries as we speak uh, is, is, is almost a plan. And if we look now, uh, people's religious beliefs should not be uh, a subject of discussion, but if we look at most of them, most of them were Jewish, and there's nothing wrong with being Jewish, but now if we look at the people in policy positions, we see 
that the, the, a lot of them are Jewish, even though Jews only lack 2% of the population. But, you know, that should not matter. But if these people were Buddhist and uh, they're after a, c a country like Burma, for instance, wouldn't you think that these re uh, their religious uh, orientation would be discussed and would be that why are these Buddhist in control of whatever or influencing uh, our, like for instance, APAC influencing our uh, Congress. You know, we have the um, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, controlling the money, controlling, uh, influencing the media. Uh, why, why someone's religious orientation should not be discussed? Why is that? Well, there's a whole history behind that, as you know. Uh, the Holocaust is uh, sacrosanct. Um, the, uh, the guilt that many Americans feel for not having uh, helped out when we knew that, that the Jews were being persecuted, the they were. And then there's this uh, mis misreading of the scripture, which is as, uh, what that uh, Sattler tried to convince us of, that you know, Jews are in entitled to that land and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me get back to your question here. The, the neocons, okay, when I used that word in my testimony before the, the Conyers Committee, I was immediately branded anti-Semitic. And I said to my mother, wow, this is something. You mentioned Israel and neocons and you're anti-Semitic. And then, you know, I read one of these, these screeds, one of these denunciations of myself, and it said, uh, McGovern uh, criticized the neoconservatives and, of course, that's just a, a code name for Jews. And I said to myself, you know, this is true here. I said, wow. I, I never thought. And then I, I wrote myself a little list, Tashim, you know. <laughs> and down the list, you know, maybe I found a Gentile in, you know, place seven and, and nine or something. But uh, I, it had never occurred to me. But indeed, most of the neoconservatives were, were Jewish. Then I said to myself, now, Ray, uh, back in the 70s when there was all that trouble in Northern Ireland, how would you feel if the head of the CIA came down and said, hey, McGovern, you're a good analyst. I'd like you to work on British policy toward Northern Ireland. I couldn't take that job. I would be so biased, so prejudiced. My grandmother told me what the British did to her relatives, to her friends and so forth, seizing the land and doing the kinds of things that occupiers do to, to, to people who are indigenous. I couldn't, I'd have to turn that job down. And so that it makes a lot of sense to have dispassionate people, people who can not be prejudiced or not be informed by their religious or cultural or, or ethnic beliefs to do the, the analysis. Now, I'd just like to add this, and that is that I don't accuse the neoconservatives of, uh, of being uh, traitors in any sense. I can see that they really and truly believe that the interests of Israel are synonymous with the interests of our country. They're just wrong. They're demonstrably wrong. And the irony of all the session is this, that the long-term, even the medium-term interests of Israel are not well served by giving them the illusion that the United States is going to support them to the tune of four to five billion a year so that they can arm themselves to the teeth. It's just not going to work over the long term. And to give them that impression does a disservice to the Israelis. Look what happened when they attacked Lebanon in July of last year. And Condoleezza Rice would not even facilitate a, a ceasefire. Those things are remembered. And besides, they didn't win in Lebanon either. So um, it, it's going to be, it's going to take enlightened leadership on the part of our country to come down off this notion that Israel can do nothing wrong and that uh, we don't really need to become involved in the, uh, in the conflict between Israel and Palestinian people. Uh, you know, George Bush, George W. Bush reversed decades-long policy in his very first National Security Council meeting when he said, uh, you know, we're not going to do this honest broker stuff anymore. We know who our friend is. Uh, Ariel Sharon's our friend. Anybody, anybody know Ariel Sharon? And, and uh, Powell said, well, yeah, I've met him. He said, well, we're going to give him his head. We're going to unleash, unleash him. Uh, and Powell, hey, now here's the Secretary of State, okay? He hadn't even known about this major change in policy. First National Security Council meeting, 10, 10 days after the inauguration. So Powell screws up all his courage, and he says, well, uh, Mr. President, uh, 
that could be rather devastating for the Palestinians. And the president says, well, uh, well you know, sometimes a show of force can really clarify things. Okay. Well, it sure has clarified things, hasn't it? And that information, by the way, comes from someone who was there. His name is Paul O'Neill. He was Secretary of the Treasury, and he had the courage to publish that in the book that uh, Susskind wrote for him. Now, very quickly, Ray, last question. Why is America unable to protect itself and preserve the Constitution uh, in, in front of this tyrant that we have in the White House? Well, I still have hope that, uh, that we can, Hashem. Uh, it's going to take uh, a lot more of the kinds of things that will make it happen, but I think the grassroots are sufficiently exercised, especially about the disgrace, and the shame of having a new attorney general that approves of forms of torture. It's just, that's the last straw for me. I think we have to put our bodies into this situation right now and not, and not do what the obedient Germans did in 1933 and following years and simply sit back and watch it all happen. Very good, Dre. Uh, Ray, I just wanted to say thank you very much. It has been a pleasure, a long-awaited pleasure to have you on the show, and hopefully we'll have you back here soon. Well, good luck to you. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was uh, Ray McGovern. He had worked for the CIA for a long time, so he should know what he's talking about. He knows the people. He knows the players. He knows how the game is played, and as a matter of fact, he is putting not just his reputation, but also his life on the line by uh, confronting. And it takes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that the people who are fighting this fight, they're individuals. They're individuals. It is personal initiatives. Don't think that Ray has this huge organization behind him. He does not. He has you, uh, hopefully, behind him. And there are many people out there who are individually making a difference. You know, Ron Paul just had uh, one of the most successful one-day donations from individuals on the Internet. He had like $4.2 million just in one night, in 24 hours, I think. And uh, that says that people, and by the way, Ron Paul is against the war. He wants to pull the troops out. But I don't know how we can pull the troops out of Iraq, by the way. I have no idea. Uh, it can't. It can't be. And as a matter of fact, I was going to ask Ray, I forgot to ask him about uh, General Petraeus' testimony. Uh, he, he was there in the congressional room, and they did not swear uh, General uh, uh, Petraeus in. So Ray said, are you going to swear him in? I guess there was... They were working on uh, Petraeus' microphone or something, so there was a little bit of silence in there. So Ray, as brave as he is, he said, are you going to swear him in? And, uh, of course, he was thrown out of the hearing because he uh, said, are you going to swear him in? So they did not swear him in, actually. They did not swear um, uh, Petraeus. I don't know if they did later on or what. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we keep bringing you this truth because, you know, we don't want as... My director here received a letter from his congressman telling him that he, that he asked him about the investigation of 9-11 or investigate, reinvestigate 9-11, and he said a thorough investigation was taking place and we know exactly what happened. Well, guess what? That investigation had Philip Zilkow as the uh, director, the executive director of it, uh, on it, who basically covered up everything that he could cover. So we do need... An investigation, that's the only thing about democracy, is if you don't have truth, you don't have democracy. If you don't have truth, you don't have democracy. That's what democracy means. That's exactly what it means, that you have the right to know exactly what is going on. And if we don't know why 3,000 American died, Americans died on 9-11, this is not a democracy. So we must ask for an independent independent investigation of 9-11 because I guarantee you you will be up in arms trying to get to the White House to get this guy out because he does not deserve to be our president he lied to us he killed many many people out there he killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis there are four million Iraqi refugees where is justice ladies and gentlemen where is justice
it was all done in your name. It was all done in your name. And I'm sure that you do not want to be referred to as the people with blood on their hands. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. But, of course, on Thursday, the 22nd, I believe, we're not going to have one on, on uh, Thanksgiving Day. But I think we will do the speech that I had. Good night. See you next week.